So I'm back in the shop tonight and uh, the other day I talked about humidity and the perfect conditions to, uh, to be spraying uh, uh, nitrate and butyrate dope is a relatively low humidity, anything below 70%. If you uh, go above 70% you do risk uh, getting moisture into the finish and the, uh, the surface blushing which is like this milky white uh, appearance in the, uh, in the paint. So I want to avoid that. So unfortunately, I'm going to hold off uh, spraying tonight because it is a little bit humid. Uh, but it gives me an opportunity to talk about uh, the fuselage uh, for the aircraft and the process uh, that I went through and, and why I decided to choose the color uh, that the fuselage is painted in. I'll show you some of the detail stuff, uh, kind of like this piece right here, um, if you guys see this. This is a uh, trailing wire antenna. Uh, this airplane, being an M model, uh, was equipped with radios, and the radios were used um, to communicate to the forward observers or the forward uh, troops on the ground during the war. Uh, the airplane the pilot would sit in the front and then the observer would sit in the rear seat uh, which spins around, I'll show you that here in a second, which spins around 180 degrees but also the M model had two radios in it. Uh, they were powered by uh, old uh, RCA radios and I was fortunate enough to be able to find the original radios as well as uh, the original RCA real antenna which means that it has a reel that you crank uh, to get uh, certain frequencies and as you crank the wheel out this chute, this drag chute here pulls the antenna line uh, back behind the aircraft to be able to pick up some of those frequencies. It's a really cool find. I'm really excited to have an original uh, trailing wire antenna uh, in, uh, in this aircraft. Uh, but let's have a, have a look around. Alright, so first let's talk about the color. Um, we have uh, olive drab here. Uh, you might think that flat olive drab is a pretty common color, right? Military color. You think of army green, it's flat olive, uh, olive drab. However, it's probably one of the most difficult colors uh, to match. And the reason is, is there were so many different shades of olive drab uh, during World War II and then into the present military. Um, it's very hard to match. Uh, fortunately, I had a, uh, uh, an original color chip from World War II that I was able to obtain and I sent it off to uh, Randolph, um, the manufacturer, the guys that make the, uh, the, uh, the butyrate dope system, uh, to color match. And they actually mix uh, pigments together to match the original color and uh, it uh, it turned out great. I, I couldn't be happier with the color match. Same with the markings. The markings on the aircraft um, are uh, laid out in the uh, position on the fuselage, in the position on the vertical uh, fin, and the rudder uh, where they would have been uh, from the factory and also in the field. Uh, this aircraft uh, has the, uh, the proper marking for the, uh, the year uh, uh, and month with the star and bars. Uh, this X26 was a, uh, was a number that they had on the side of these aircraft uh, when they were on the line uh, at the Air Force Base that this, uh, uh, this aircraft was based at. So I was able to replicate that by getting uh, some original photos, but also uh, the original engineering drawings, the pilot's operation handbook, and um, uh, when I was when I did my first L2, actually, um, we went down to the Smithsonian and did search, uh, did a search in the archives, and was able to uh, uh, obtain uh, four or five rolls of different microfiche that had the engineering drawings on it for the Taylorcraft L2. So uh, again, uh, everything was laid out. The way that I did this, um, after I sprayed all the nitrate dope, after I sprayed all the butyrate dope. Uh, got it up through its color. I then created uh, masks. 
All right, um, I used uh, uh, a local sign company to uh, create the masks for uh, the star and bars, and then the font for the uh, the field numbers uh, on the side of the fuselage and on the uh, the vertical fin. I matched the font to uh, uh, to documentation, photo documentation that I had from uh, the air or from the year 1943. Uh, at the uh, same field that this aircraft was based at during the war. So I feel uh, very comfortable with the, uh, the accuracy, historical accuracy of the markings, and uh, I think it turned out very nice. So my goal for this airplane uh, throughout this entire restoration process is to have this airplane to be as uh, accurate historically uh, as I can make it uh, within reason. And, and really what that means is what, what I want this aircraft to have is everything that would have had when it left the factory in 1943 plus anything that the military would have added uh, to uh, put this aircraft into service uh, during World War II. There's a lot of documentation out there to help uh, achieve my goal. Uh, but, uh, you know, the internet's terrific with eBay and, and things like that, but it's, uh, it's a bit of a process to uh, go out and search on eBay for, uh, you know, the mooring kit, for instance, that sits in the back of the aircraft. Uh, but I was able to locate one of those, the medical kit that uh, is an aeronautical medical kit uh, from World War II that sits, uh, that's mounted on the side of the wall in there. All the... Uh, Instruments that are on the instrument panel are original from that era, from 1943. I was able to locate all of the original style instruments and send those out uh, to get them overhauled. And, uh, and not only just to get them overhauled, but they'll also get the markings on the faces of those instruments in the same color that they would have been uh, in 1943. So uh, every uh, effort that I could make uh, to uh, for originality's sake, um, I went through uh, with this restoration. Um, the, the radios uh, that you can see, uh, those are the original uh, transmitter and receiver radios uh, that, that this aircraft would have had um, um, at, at the time that it was uh, in service. Again, the antenna, the trailing wire antenna, is an original uh, antenna that would have been in this aircraft. I was able to locate a lot of new old stock parts for this aircraft, which is very exciting to find uh, whenever you can find anything new old stock and, uh, and be able to use it in the aircraft. So I'm really excited about the genometer gauge. Um, that's right, I said genometer. Uh, down underneath the instrument panel, sitting on top of the power supply box, um, is another control box which turns off and on the power for the wind generator that this aircraft had. That's right, a wind generator. This airplane has a Continental 65 horsepower engine, which means that it has no generator, has no alternator uh, attached to the engine. So there is no engine driven um, electrical system in this aircraft. So all the radios that were powered, even in 1943, were powered off of a battery that was mounted on the back side of the firewall. That battery was charged uh, by the use of a wind generator, which is actually made by Champion, um, and that gets mounted out on the left uh, lift strut. Right, so let's talk about uh, performance. Let's talk about this thing. Uh, this is a Continental A65 uh, engine. Um, that's right, Continental A65. 65 represents the horsepower of this uh, uh, beast. <laughs> Not really. This. It's all about the pure fun of flying and the love of aviation, low and slow. Uh, A65s were used in the Piper Cubs. Uh, this, uh, this is an original engine for this aircraft. Um, this airplane cruises at about 87 miles an hour. Remember, this is a liaison aircraft. It was de designed to fly low and slow, land in uh, unimproved uh, landing strips, uh, mainly at treetop level to look for um, uh, forward uh, for troops and radio them back to the troops on the ground. This engine um, I took apart, uh, everything was sent out. Every uh, part of the engine, the crankshaft, the camshaft, the connecting rods, uh, it's got uh, new uh, overhauled uh, cylinders, new piston, uh, new piston pins. Uh, the carburetor was totally taken apart. 
and, uh, and overhauled. Uh, everything was sent out. Um, I utilize aircraft specialties in Oklahoma. Uh, they, I send all the parts out. They magnaflux every uh, 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 part of the, uh, the engine. Uh, they check for cracks. They check for corrosions. They regrind the crank if needed. Um, they do a wonderful job. It comes back in several different boxes. Uh, looking like brand new engine parts uh, recertified. Last but not so. least, I'm going to talk about the glass. Uh, being a liaison aircraft, an observation airplane, uh, visibility was a uh, primary focus in designing of this aircraft. Uh, the really neat design about the L2 is it's got a drop turtle deck. M much like a Cub, where it has a raised turtle deck, it would come up directly to uh, the back side of the uh, top of the uh, cockpit there. Taylorcraft lowered that, okay, lowered the turtle deck, and put in this bubble window in the back. Very unique to this aircraft, this style of aircraft, um, and uh, it's, uh, so visibility is incredible. The observer would sit in the back, they would spin the seat around 180 degrees, okay, and then they, there's a desk in the back that they would take notes on, they would use the radio, what have you, but they would be looking aft. Uh, while the, uh, the, the pilot was facing the other direction flying the airplane, obviously. Um, what I did is this is all new glass. The rear part, um, you're able to get through a, a, a supplier, Great Lakes Aeroplastics, actually. Um, so I, I bought a rear new glass piece. It required a good bit of trimming, but that's the first piece that goes on. These side pieces right here, they all had to be hand-formed, hand-heated, and bent. Uh, because that is not commercially available and then the top pieces uh, again are all custom fit uh, pieces of plexiglass. So I'm happy with the way uh, the glass turned out and um, next step is to get a, a cover, a Bruce's custom cover uh, to protect it and uh, to make, keep it from you know, getting scratched.